That means that it has no SD cards and we're actually recording this to a medium stream. Yep, so right now it's telling and saying everyone what we're saying. Committee. We love acronyms. It's the SECC, which is part of the Tourism Development Authority of Reagan County. And on behalf of the entire committee and everybody else, we want to welcome you here tonight. This is a kickoff event for what portends to be a fabulous day tomorrow. Our weather's good. The Lord's smiling on us. The prayers are working. And we're going to have a great weather. And we've got a really great event planned in addition to, oh, the Lord's going to have an eclipse for us tomorrow. So we're going to have that too. Um, let me tell you a little about how we got to where we are. About 13 months ago, Laura Gurley, who's the chairperson of the TDA and sitting in the back sweating because she's our volunteer coordinator, uh, asked me if I would chair a small committee to look at the possibility of having an event because we were having a total solar class. And I said, sure, I'll do that, knowing nothing about what I was getting into. But, but Laura will tell you we were all totally ignorant. We had no clue. And uh, since then, it's grown into uh, this magnificent event. We sold out our tickets uh, Tuesday night, and we cut them off at 10,003 tickets, just to give you an idea of the demand that we've had for it. Uh, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. As far as the number of volunteers I'm going to recognize tonight, my committee, uh, we've had just hundreds of people working in various capacities. So I'm going to recognize a few people that are on my committee, but I want you to understand there are a lot more people that have worked on this. And an interesting thing about this is um, Tika Earnhardt is our executive director, is the only soured employee we have. The rest of us are volunteers. And that's a pretty amazing thing. Her daughter, uh, Josie, is working with us this summer, and she said, well, what about me and my chopped liver? I'm paid. And I said, no, no, but full time, uh, Tika's it. And she's been a magnificent uh, executive director in getting this event going, but uh, I'm going to introduce the committee members in just a moment. Uh, we wanted to do three things when we started. We wanted this event to be family friendly. I think we're going to succeed with that. It's, it's just a, it's going to be a magnificent event. The second thing we want to do is we want to be really focused on youth and the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and math. And, and you're going to see we're going to do that tomorrow. There's just so many great things for young people to experience, get immersed in, and to get excited about science. And using the eclipse as the set piece, if you will, to do that. The third thing, we really wanted to highlight Ray County. We are the Tourism Development Authority, and we want to bring people here so that they will love Raven County and come back. So we consider ourselves ambassadors, and we hope you do too when you encounter people from out of the county, that you'll show all we have to offer here in Raven County. Because ultimately that benefits us all. Uh, our tax base drops because people bring money into the county. There are just lots of benefits for that. And as uh, you experience tonight and tomorrow, I hope you'll see that we've come close to these objectives and, and as we go through the day tomorrow. Tonight we're 19 hours away from totality. 19 hours. Two minutes and 38 seconds seems a lot to get excited about, but there's a lot more going on than that. The whole event's about an hour and 33 minutes. And uh, we call this event Out of Sight, and that's a great name for it, I think. It's the Out of Sight Festival, Viewing Festival tomorrow. Before I introduce Dr. Bechtel tonight, I'd like to introduce my uh, SECC committee. And uh, I'm going to read their names so I don't forget anybody. And just ask them to stand in place. And if you'll hold your applause after we're done, I'd like to give them a round of applause. So let's start with Lucky Stack. And some of these are here and some are not. Sandra Kimsey, Kathy Turner, Jim Wallace. Jim is, uh, if he's not here, he's still down there putting video boards together. Uh, I saw him a little while ago. Danny Vincent also is down on the field. He's not up with us tonight. 
Now, Brother Bob Price, Nolan Leake is also down on the field. So most of the people on my committee are still down working. Now, just to remain standing, Kathy. Uh, Penny Burkett. Where's Penny? Okay, there's Penny. Laura Schott. Sam White, who are representatives from uh, Reverend Gatmacucci School. Gwen Fink. Is Gwen here tonight? She's working at the visitor's Okay. Uh, Tracy Long. Josh Addis, who's the manager of Lake Raven Hotel and uh, our vendor coordinator. Sue Willis, Laura Gurley, Laura's back here, and Tika Earnhardt. And Tika's either out in the lobby or here. There she is. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, if you notice the artwork on either sides of the lobby tonight, it was done by Leroy Young, uh, who was a former Piedmont professor. And uh, Dr. Scro tells us they displayed this art tonight just for this event and for tomorrow. And it's all uh, scientific related to astronomy and uh, eclipses. So if you would enjoy that as you leave. Let me ask one other favor. Um, we've had some cancellations in our volunteer crew. And if any of you would like to volunteer, here's what I can do for you. I can give you a neat, snazzy apron, <laughs> a name tag, a free lunch, uh, free water, and we'll work you like a dog. <laughs> so if you would, if any of you really consider that, we've already signed uh, Dr. Jones up tonight and his wife I wanted to come. I said, fine. Laura said, you can come, but you're going to work. So it's what we call voluntold. So Laura, stand up again. See Laura in the, the green blouse here. If any of you can help tomorrow, please see Laura and we'll sign you up. We have some holes we need to fill, and I would really, really appreciate it, and, uh, and we'll get you signed up. So having said that, I want to introduce Dr. Beckville briefly and, and not take any more of his time than necessary, but I'm reminded of an old story that was told about Eleanor Roosevelt, when Franklin Roosevelt was our president. And she was invited to be the graduation speaker at a high school. And the uh, young lady who was selected to introduce the first lady I called up the White House and asked to speak to uh, Mrs. Roosevelt's personal secretary to find out some background information so she could introduce her properly. So when she talked to the secretary, she said, well, Mrs. Roosevelt is a very modest woman, and she would be very unhappy if you went into great detail or lengthy introductions. She doesn't need all that. So the young lady took that to heart. The big day came, or um, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's on the dais. The young lady gets up to introduce her, and she said, I'd like to introduce our graduation speaker today, our first lady, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, and the less said about her, the better. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not true of Keith, but I'm going to be brief. I, I want you to know a little about him because uh, he brings a tremendous background to it. First of all, let me tell you that a good number of his family members are seated up there tonight. We appreciate y'all being with us tonight. His lovely wife, Ellen, and their new baby are sitting up there also. So welcome. Um, Dr. Bechtel was raised in Virginia, and he went to William & Mary, where he met his future wife. And by the way, Ellen is the daughter of Nancy Childress, the owner of Raven Manor and one of our ministers at uh, First Methodist Clayton. So the family connection is there. Anyway, he graduated from William & Mary, went out to Stanford, and received his Ph.D. in physics, where uh, Ellen went also and, and worked also. And so they both had their Ph.D., and then from there went to the uh, University of Chicago for postdoctorates, where they were both uh, working there, and uh, then the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison in October of 2016, so a little less than a year ago. They both accepted positions, at, and I love acronyms again, LLST. If anybody knows what that is other than Keith, raise your hand. Yeah, somebody does, okay. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, based in Tucson, Arizona. And uh, Dr. Bechtel's a staff scientist while Ellen works in outreach education. And starting next year, the fall of 2018, he'll be the assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So that's kind of his career track. Uh, they have their first child. <coughs> Uh, Claire Theodore was uh, born on January 19th of this year, so a, a very new arrival in the Bechtel household. In his career, he's discovered more than a dozen small galaxies and uh, has visited six continents. I see on his laptop it says Antarctica, so I know he's been there. Right? You get the bumper sticker when you go there, right, Keith? <laughs> and uh, for scientific research, and his research involves dark matter, dark energy, neutrinos, Supernovas and his experience with telescopes includes mountains, high altitude, balloons, deep within glaciers, and in outer space. And with that, let's give a warm Raven County welcome to Dr. Keith Bechtel. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yes. All right, great. 
Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for having me. Um, as, as was mentioned by, by Alan, uh, I have family here in the beautiful mountains of North Georgia, so it's always great to visit, and uh, I really appreciate you all having me uh, to talk. So I'm going to uh, talk about the eclipse, uh, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about the history of how the eclipse has helped us understand uh, physics more generally. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so first of all, uh, for those of you that are visiting, congratulations for making it. Uh, I understand it's been quite a journey. Uh, the eclipse is something that will be visible to you know, all across the United States, but there's a special line of totality here, uh, which is only about 70 miles wide, and it turns out that, uh, that Raven County is right in the center of that path of totality. So we're really in kind of a unique position to get the best view of the eclipse. And so many people have probably traveled uh, many hours in order to, in order to reach us. So to put this in perspective, uh, this is just uh, what's called a drive shed. So just like a watershed where water collects, this is like a drive shed where cars have been traveling uh, to get to the line of totality. So we expect that millions of Americans have actually made this trip today. And in fact, this may be uh, a historical event in the sense that it is the largest single day migration of people at any time. <laughs> if you think about it, I'm, I'm serious, if you think about the United States, there are you know, 350 Americans and many of us have cars. And so this, you know, because the eclipses are a relatively rare event, this may be you know, the, the single biggest event in terms of like most photographed, most tweeted, et cetera. So it's really an exciting occasion. And this is a map uh, showing where the darkest regions of the map are where there have been the most Google searches for the eclipse. And it turns out that, that Raven County is actually in the top five among all the counties in the United States. So I hear there's a lot of local interest. So um, anyhow, I think it's just amazing how you can see that the you know what's on people's minds and how they're searching the internet actually you know, coincides very closely with what's what's happening in the skies. Okay, so this is what I mentioned before, is that uh, you know, this, this is showing the swath uh, where the eclipse is traveling over North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And you can see that right here at Raven Gap, we're basically right on that line of totality. And so we're at this special point where we'll be able to see the eclipse for its longest duration. And as I mentioned before, this is about two minutes and 38 seconds. This shadow is moving over the Earth at a speed of something like uh, 1,500 miles per hour. So it's just flying across the United States, um, and hopefully we'll get a great view of the event tomorrow. Uh, this is just to put it in context, again, why people might be so excited about this, is that these eclipses only happen about maybe once, once every year and a half, somewhere on the Earth. But in a given place, you know, if you're at, a, at one single spot, that may only happen about once every 400 years. So the last, uh, the last uh, total solar eclipse that was visible um, from the continental United States uh, was back in 1979, uh, and that one touched uh, in, the, in the, north, uh, the northwest uh, part of the country. Um, there was an eclipse that touched Hawaii in 1991, but many people, you know, I, I was not alive in 1979, so this will be my first opportunity. Actually, how many people here have seen a, a total eclipse before? Wow, okay, okay, not bad. So this will be my first, and so I'm, I'm really excited to, to see it. Um, so this is, you know, obviously tomorrow, uh, the 21st of August 2017, uh, and the next chance that we'll have uh, in, in the United States uh, is April 8th of 2024. So this is uh, this one that's cutting, cutting across here. These are all the eclipses coming up in the next century. Okay, so the eclipse is one of the most uh, spectacular sights that we can see in nature. And so, you know, tomorrow I'm just going to be trying to enjoy it. Um, but what I want to mention uh, in this talk today is, is the eclipse has also been extremely important scientifically, in particular in the history of understanding the force of gravity. So I'll make sure to try to, to touch on this. And so uh, I'm going to try to tell this as a, as a bit of a story of how the eclipse and understanding of gravity are actually deeply intertwined. And so just to give a, a sense, you know, gravity is, is in some ways, you know, the most familiar force to us, right? I mean, we, you know, we feel it every day, but, you know, I was reminded uh, by our young daughter a couple months ago, she started, you know, dropping her toys off, off the, the, the table when she was, you know, having her meals. And, it, you know, it reminded me that, you know, even though it's, it's somehow commonplace in our life, it's still very strange, right? It's kind of this invisible attractive force. We don't see anything pulling. And in many ways, even with all of our deep scientific knowledge about the eclipse, there's still some fundamental questions that we'd like to answer. So for much of human history, in fact, the vast majority of human history, gravity has simply been a fact of life, 
right? I mean, we've been able to build structures, and you know, it, it's been part of our lives, but we didn't necessarily have a deep mathematical understanding of how it worked. Now, this change uh, with, uh, with the idea of Newtonian gravity, which is named after Isaac Newton, he was the first person to actually write down a mathematical description of gravity. And one of the deep insights that he had is that the same force of gravity that we feel when we jump or when we throw a football, this force of gravity that we feel on the surface of the Earth, is actually the same force that keeps the planets in orbit around the sun. Right? And so this is actually one of the virtues that we really talk about when we talk about a, a theories of physics, is that our theories should try to explain as many different phenomena as possible. And so with one simple idea, if you can explain things that seem very different, that's a big success. So Newton what, you know, came up with this idea of, of Newtonian gravity, and I'm just sort of encapsulating it by this equation, but this has been our, our mathematical foundation for, for many years. Now the, the model that we talk about today, our, our, our current understanding of gravity uh, is what we call general relativity, and this is my kind of artistic impression of what, of what this means. It's this idea that what we experience of, of gravity is actually a curvature of space-time. That basically, space and time are interlinked in a way that's inseparable. And so we really talk about space-time as a physical entity. And so you see these clocks melting. That's, you know, that's maybe what, what, you know, what my brain feels like sometimes when I think about this. Right? You know, but it's, this is the current mathematical description that we have. Um, and I'll talk about some of the amazing, some of the really profound things that this idea leads us to in terms of thinking about our place in the universe. So we're going to try to tell this story you know, about gravity you know, is, is, is our path to understand the nature of space, time, matter, and energy. These are really basic questions that humans have always asked about, about nature. And I'm going to try to tell this story um, in three uh, significant historical eclipses. Um, the eclipse of 1715, 1878, and 1918. But before going into this historical story, uh, I'd like to begin by talking about what is the eclipse, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. I think a lot of people probably know, but it never hurts to have a reminder. So this diagram here is showing the Earth moving around the Sun, or sorry, the, uh, the Earth moving around the Sun, and then the Moon going around the Earth. And this is a kind of distinct diagram because it's actually showing the Moon and the Earth to scale. Um, so you can see how small the Moon is, um, this large separation between the Earth and the Moon. And so when the geometry is just right, you know, the, when, the, when the moon passes between the Earth and the sun, uh, the shadow of the moon is cast upon the surface of the Earth. Um, so some of the things that you might notice in this diagram is that actually the orbit of the moon is somewhat inclined, so it doesn't always pass in front of the Earth. It's only on these relatively rare occasions that it crosses in front and the shadow exactly lines up with the surface of the Earth. So this is physically uh, what's happening. Uh, during the eclipse. This is another view, as if you can imagine if we were in some kind of spaceship outside the Earth, and we can zoom around and fly around the Earth and the Moon system, and so you can see that the, the, you know, the sun would be off the screen, shining here, uh, the shadow is being cast by the Moon, and it's actually a relatively small shadow. Um, this region, the 70 mile width, is, is the path of the totality. And so even though all of the North America will be you know, partially in the shadow, it's only the special region where we have the totality. So that's what we're going to be looking for. OK, so why does this actually happen? Well, it's, it's kind of an amazing coincidence of nature uh, that the relative sizes, as viewed from the Earth, of the moon and the sun are very, very similar. Each is about a half a degree across, which is about the scale as if you hold up your, your thumb at arm's length. It's about, it's about that size. Um, but the thing is, is that the, the, the sun is actually 400 times larger than the moon, but it's also 400 times further away. And so that's why even though it's so much larger, it appears to be roughly the same size as the moon as we from Earth. And so when the moon crosses in front, it's actually this, you know, this, perfect, uh, this perfect kind of uh, geometric uh, uh, occultation, um, which allows us to see the, the corona and the, and the beautiful eclipse. So, but if we, were to, if we were to put these uh, to physical scale next to each other, you know, this is the sun, right? the Earth and the moon. So when you think about it, it's, it's really kind of a remarkable coincidence that it ended up this way. It didn't have to be. And to really kind of you know, drive this point home, uh, we've actually been able to see eclipses from other planets. 
now that we have space probes that are going out and exploring the solar system, uh, we can see this phenomenon. And so, for instance, the, the Curiosity robotic, robotic rover on the surface of Mars, uh, you know, we're able to predict when these eclipses happen. And so the telescope you know, on, on, the, on the top of this, uh, uh, this instrument looked up and saw the moon of, of Mars, Phobos, cross across uh, the face of the sun. And you can see here, Phobos is kind of like a lumpy potato. <laughs> um, and it's much smaller. And in fact, the, the Earth is really the only body in the solar system that has this perfect alignment between the sun and the moon where they appear the same size. And even on the Earth, this isn't a, a lasting phenomenon. In fact, a billion years from now, the moon will have drifted far enough away from the Earth that there won't be any more total eclipses. So we're actually, even now, you know, at this moment in time, kind of living in a special time when this happens. Um, so we should, we should really enjoy how beautiful this is. Um, this is actually a view of what the eclipse looks like from space. Uh, this is a view uh, taken from the International Space Station, where you can see uh, the shadow. This is part of the boom of the space station. So, you know, just to kind of, again, get in real life, like an actual photograph, what this looks like. And I love this graphic. Um, so this is, uh, you might see that shadow that flies across. This will just loop around. So the way that this is an actual video taken from a spacecraft orbiting the Earth, uh, it's a geosynchronous satellite, which means that it hovers at a single spot over the Earth. That its rotation speed exactly uh, coincides with the rotation speed of the Earth. So even though it's orbiting the Earth, it appears to stay in a fixed position above the Earth. This one is actually a weather satellite parked over Japan, and so you can see all the beautiful clouds that are changing uh, throughout this 24-hour period as the, as the Earth is rotating. Now, the shadow that zips across, that's actually one of the eclipses. Right? So you can see how it just, it just flies across in a matter, a matter of hours. And so you know, when you see an image like this, it really kind of puts, puts, uh, it makes this very concrete and tangible right? in terms of realizing exactly what's happening. So I really love this movie. So this is what the eclipse will look like um, from across the United States. I mentioned that it will be visible from, from everywhere uh, in the United States, but you might notice that on the path of totality, uh, the sun is completely blocked, whereas in other regions of the United States, you see various degrees to which the sun uh, is blocked. And so uh, these would be called partial eclipses, whereas, for instance, you know, here in Raven County, uh, we do get the, the, complete, uh, the complete obscuration uh, by the moon. Um, and so, uh, again, I think this is kind of a useful way of seeing how, why it is that we're kind of a special spot for, uh, for the event tomorrow. Okay, so here's a, a timeline just to get in people's minds exactly uh, what will be happening. Uh, this is specifically as viewed from Diller, Georgia. Um, so the first contact, meaning that when the moon first touches the disk of the sun, uh, this will occur at 1.06 p.m. tomorrow. And then over uh, the next hour and a half, uh, there'll be this buildup where more and more of the sun uh, is blocked by the moon. And then at 2.35 p.m., uh, we'll enter uh, this period of totality, this two minutes and 38 seconds, uh, where the moon is completely blocking uh, the disk of the sun, and we'll be able to see that hot solar corona. So we call it second contact when totality starts. Third contact is when the totality ends, and we begin to see the surface of the sun again. And then fourth contact is when, again, the moon and the sun are fully separated from each other, and that will occur uh, at 4 1 p.m. Now, just as a, as a I feel, you know, it's important to mention uh, that the totality is the only safe time uh, to look uh, at the eclipse without the protection of the eclipse glasses. So at all other times, you should make sure to have the proper uh, eye protection, and some glasses don't count. Right. It, has, it has to be uh, the eclipse glasses, or you can use a pinhole camera and you cast the light on the associated paper or the ground. I understand there also will be video projectors tomorrow. Um, so just as a, as a safety note, and this is really you know, worth driving home. Uh, so even in the moments just before and just after totality, uh, there's this you know, very bright point of light uh, where the moon and the sun have not exactly matched each other, and so it kind of looks almost like a diamond ring. Sometimes these are called Bailey's beads. Um, this is not safe. You still need the eye protection. It's only during totality 
um, that it's okay to take your glasses off. So again, this is really, really important. You only get one set of eyes, so please, please be safe out there. One of the amazing things about the eclipse uh, is and one of the things to really look for uh, when it's happening is to just see how dynamic the sun is. Um, so this is a view of the sun where we can see all of the activity of the magnetic fields and just see how uh, incredibly active the sun really is. This is a video that's looping over a period of four hours. And so during the eclipse, this is one of the really beautiful things to see is all this activity that's happening on the edge of the sun uh, in the corona. You know, and really, the eclipse is kind of our, our unique chance to see that with our own eyes. Um, this is taken by NASA satellite. Okay, so now I'd like to, to go back, um, now that we've kind of reviewed what the eclipse is and what's going to happen tomorrow, I'd like to turn to actually the history of how we've used the eclipse to get a better understanding of gravity. Um, so I'll talk about this again in these, in these three historical um, so first, it's useful to go back in time before we actually had a mathematical understanding of gravity. Even at those times, uh, basically the, the ancient astronomers and every civilization around the world you know, were very interested in this phenomenon. You can imagine how before understanding what the eclipse was, it would have been terrifying you know, to see the sun being blotted out from the, you know, the sky turned dark and you're able to see the stars during the middle of the day. This must have been you know, just, just an incredible uh, you know, a terrifying phenomenon. And so it was very useful for people to take records of this and to record uh, when these eclipses happened. And so even the ancient astronomers knew something called the sorrow cycles, where there's, a, a, there's three sets of eclipses uh, that occur with a similar geometry every 54 years. Um, so these are paths of eclipses uh, that, you know, if you looked at the Earth from the North Pole, you see these sets. And so I'll number these. So I put numbered on these different arcs. And so you can see it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so each one of these arcs is separated by about 18 years. And every 54 years, uh, you come back to a similar spot on the Earth. So this seven here is the eclipse that's happening tomorrow, 2017. But there was an eclipse with a similar geometry that happened 54 years before. And so using this method, ancient astronomers could actually anticipate when the eclipses would happen. They wouldn't know exactly, and they couldn't predict exactly where on the Earth that they would occur, but they would know roughly, and they could use this at least to get some, get some sense of when this might happen. Um, so this is where our, understood, our understanding of the eclipses stood for you know, many, many hundreds, even thousands of years. This is just another way of looking at this. Again, these, these sorrow cycles, where again, each of these yellow bands uh, is happening every, every 54 years. And so you can see how they're kind of you know, marching across the planet. Um, and so this is, this is what people use for a long period of time. And you can think now, you know, now that we understand this, we can actually go backwards in time, and we can use these recordings of the eclipses in history to actually date specific events, because you know, we knew that this eclipse happened at this particular place on the Earth at this particular place. So that's very useful for historians. Now this changed in the 1700s because, because we had now a mathematical understanding of gravity. And so the first person to actually predict uh, using this idea of gravity uh, was Edmund Halley, uh, who you may know uh, from Halley's Comet. Right? So he, he was the one who, uh, who realized that this, you know, that this uh, comet that came into the uh, view of the Earth every, I think it's every 77 years, um, he, you know, he realized uh, that this would happen, became very famous. He, it turns out he didn't actually live long enough to, to see his prediction verified. But what he did live to see uh, was a similar prediction about the eclipse. Um, so this is his map um, from, uh, from 1715. There was an eclipse that he knew was going to happen over London and over England uh, generally. And so he made this map that was showing his prediction of where the eclipse would occur and when it would occur on the 3rd of May, 1715, uh, which has been now called uh, Halley's Eclipse. And so this is, this is his before map. And he went out of his way to advertise this, to let people know. And it's interesting to see what he wrote. He wrote, hereby they will see that there is nothing in it more than natural, 
and no more than the necessary result of the motions of the sun and the moon, and how well those are understood will appear by this eclipse. Basically telling people in the 1700s, don't freak out, don't be scared, right? Like, this is something that we now, we now have a mathematical understanding of, right? He really wanted people to know not to be afraid of this. And so this is his aftermath, right? Is updated after the eclipse. And you can see that he was remarkably close. This was amazing. In 1715, right, if you compare these maps, right, this is what he predicted, and this is the result, right? So he predicted the time of the eclipse within four minutes of what actually occurred, and the location to within 20 miles. Just amazing when you actually think about it. Serious number crunching. Yeah. So this was, this was the first time that we were able to predict the eclipse mathematically. And you can imagine that you know, for the believers in Newtonian gravity, this was a huge event, right? This was a validation of these, this mathematical description of gravity, this understanding of how the planets move uh, was, was a, reasonable, a reasonable way to move forward and to understand the universe. Now the next major, uh, like really sort of amazing test of Newtonian gravity came with the discovery of Neptune. And so Neptune is one of the planets that we can't see with the unaided eye. It requires a telescope. And it turns out that many astronomers had actually seen Neptune over hundreds of years after the telescope was invented, but they didn't know what they were looking at. They didn't recognize that it as a new planet. And so uh, there, was a, there was a period, um, and this was in the, in the mid-1800s, uh, where mathematicians began to look at the motions of the planets in the outer solar system particular Uranus, and they realized that the orbits didn't look quite right, but the orbits could be explained if there was another planet, an eighth planet out, out in the outer solar system. And so they actually predicted the existence of Neptune before seeing it. Right? This is an example of where we used gravity to sense something that was previously unknown. And so the mathematicians, the, the theoretical physicists, they pointed to the observers, they said, look in this specific part of the sky at this specific time, and they pinpointed the location of Neptune to within one degree, right? Imagine that. Remember, your thumb is a half a degree across. And they told the observers where to look to within one degree of precision. And so uh, Johann Gottfried Geil, uh, who was the observer who discovered uh, Neptune, you know, this is his drawing of his star chart showing the positions of the predicted and discovered locations of Neptune. And he writes, the planet whose place you have computed really exists. Right? A tremendous success. Newtonian gravity. And again, this kind of confirmation that our understanding of gravity was becoming more and more mature. So there's a, there's a sort of a sidetrack in the story. Um, and this has to do uh, with the orbital motion of another planet in our solar system, in this case, the one that's closest to the sun. And this is an anomaly called the precession of perihelion of Mercury. So this is a curious case. Uh, astronomers were looking at the orbit of Mercury, and they could see that the elliptical orbit of Mercury was, was moving, moving very slightly, about 570 uh, arc seconds per century. Okay, so very, very slowly processing. Okay, and so they could explain this partially by the tugs of the other planets pulling on Mercury, but there was a little bit left over, about 10% of this precession, that they couldn't account for. And so you can imagine, this is the mid-1800s, they had just discovered Neptune. People became convinced that there had to be another planet inside the orbit of Mercury. And they called this planet Vulcan. It's a hypothetical planet. And so this is taken from the textbook uh, at around that period of time. And you can see, you know, here's Earth, Venus, Mercury, and Vulcan. They put it in their textbooks, right? Because they were so convinced that there had to be another planet there to explain why the Mercury's orbit was behaving in this kind of strange way. And so uh, the eclipse is really a unique time to test this idea, because when you're looking towards the, Earth, you know, the inner part of the solar system, you're necessarily looking towards the sun. And many people never actually see Mercury during their lifetime, because it's always so close to the sun that when the sun is up, it's daytime. Right? And you can't, you can't see the stars and the planets uh, in that part of the sky. And so they realized that if you look during an eclipse, right, and something's going to happen tomorrow, we'll have this amazing view of the inner solar system that we would never get to see otherwise. Um, they realized that they could look for the planet Vulcan. 
And so in 1878, there was an eclipse that came across the United States. And the American astronomers were tremendously excited about this and decided they were going to look for Vulcan. And one of the astronomers, James Craig Watson, said that he actually saw it. And this is his, uh, this is his star chart. So this is the location of the moon and the sun during the eclipse, right, overlapping with each other. And he's made this mark here, and he's labeled it Vulcan, right? He was convinced, right, this was, like, in, in, you have to put yourself in the frame of mind of the astronomers of that, that time, right, that this was, this was the only way that they could explain the orbit of Mercury. So this planet had to exist. Now, James Craig Watson became a superstar overnight. This was in all of the newspapers. He became famous. Um, and, uh, over time, though, people said, well, well, this is kind of funny, right? It's like, why didn't anybody else see the planet in this location? <laughs> you know, this, this, is, this is kind of strange, you know, what's going on? And so James Craig Watson, the, uh, this idea, he, he became, he literally drove him mad. He had this idea that he would build an underground telescope. And he actually built this into the side of the hill with the idea that if you built the telescope underground, it would block the rays of light from the sun, and you could see the stars during the daytime. Now, I think many people in this room will realize that this is a, a, a preposterous idea. There's no, there's no way that this could work, right? It was, it was doomed from the start, right? But he was building this telescope, and he was doing it in Wisconsin during the winter, and he caught a cold, and he actually died while overseeing this project. And, like, it literally drove him, drove him mad, you know, pursuing this idea that was just never meant to be, because the planet Vulcan simply doesn't exist. And so uh, this is a good example. It's a good, it's a good you know, kind of example in the history of science. But we should, we should be really careful, you know, even though we have some idea, you know, no matter how hard we believe it, it doesn't make it true. Right? We always have to be looking for new evidence. And so the answer to this, this question about the orbit of Mercury, the answer didn't come until several, uh, several decades later. And it actually took Albert Einstein to find and unravel the mystery. And so he was working at this time on a, new, on a new theory of gravity, what we call general relativity. And he wasn't initially motivated by this, by this you know, procession of paraphilia and Mercury. He was actually doing it for his own sort of mathematical curiosity. But once he had this theory, he was reminded of this problem. And so he went, he did the math, he did the calculation, and it turned out that his new, new understanding of gravity could actually exactly predict the motion of, of Mercury. And in fact, not only did it render Vulcan unnecessary, it actually meant that Vulcan couldn't exist, right? Because Vulcan would, would you know, would, would further disrupt the orbit. Um, so he says, you know, in a letter to one of his colleagues, he says, I was beside myself for a few days in joyous excitement. This was actually the first experimental evidence into support of his theory. And so you can imagine how thrilled he must have been that he had this totally new conception of space and time, and here it was being borne out um, in real observations in the sky. So let's take a moment and actually you know, talk about what is general relativity, because it is kind of a mind-bending idea. There are many different ways of talking about general relativity, but the, the way I like to think about it most is that it's this deep connection to realizing that space and time are actually interconnected in a, in a very serious way, that they're, that they're basically inseparable. Okay? And it's easiest for me to think about this if I think about its actual consequences. Like what, it, like what does it actually do? And how does it actually work? And so one way that makes this very concrete you know, how many people have smartphones right now, like right now in their pocket? Okay? So the navigation for the smartphones is based on something called the Global Positioning System, GPS. It's a constellation of satellites that's in constant orbit around the Earth. And when the first uh, of these GPS satellites was launched that had an atomic clock, I believe this was in 1977, um, initially the engineers, uh, you know, they were a little bit skeptical. They were like, well, do we really need to include general relativity? And the reason why they, were, you know, they, they weren't sure is because uh, these satellites, they're in much higher orbit over the Earth. So the gravitational field of the location of these satellites is much weaker than it is on the surface of the Earth. Well, not much weaker, but enough that you can, that you can measure a difference. Um, and it turns out that this difference, as predicted by general relativity, is about 38 microseconds per day. Now, a microsecond, this is one millionth of a second. So this doesn't sound like very much. Right? But if you don't correct it, it leads to errors of about six miles per day in your location. 
which you know, we probably don't want that when we're driving around town. Right? That, that, would, that would make you know, Google Maps pretty much useless, right? Um, and so they were initially, you know, they put up this atomic clock, and they were initially unsure, you know, should we really, you know, is this really important? Do we really need to do this? And it turned out that, that the observations with their atomic clock in space showed that the clocks were ticking slightly faster on the satellite than they were on the Earth. They had calibrated on the Earth, they had put it into orbit, and the clock ticked slower. So this is, I think, the most, really the most direct evidence that we have that time and gravity are deeply intertwined. There's no way to separate them. In some sense, they're really you know, two different parts of the same thing. And so uh, this, is, this, you know, this is what general relativity is like really bearing out in our own life, uh, even now as we speak. So one of the other things that Einstein realized after predicting, using his theory of general relativity to predict the orbit of Mercury and realizing that this was correct, right? In some sense, the orbit of Mercury was already known, right? So to really test his theory, he had to predict something new. He realized that he had to predict something that had never been seen before to really test his theory. And he realized that one way this could be tested is with a technique called gravitational lensing. And this is, uh, you can think about this as the deflection of light in a curved space-time. That gravity is the warping of space and time, and that light is traveling in a straight line, but if space is curved, if space-time is curved, then it will appear to have been bent. Okay? Again, it's kind of trippy. It's not something that we usually think about in everyday life. I mean, it's a really small effect. So, for example, if you're looking at a, at a star that's right next to the edge of the sun, and again, you want to do this during an eclipse because you're looking right near the surface of the sun, the deflection corresponds to about an inch. Like, if you could see a block an inch tall from two miles away, that's the level of the deflection that we're talking about. Extremely small signal. But nevertheless, Einstein thought that this could be measured. And so this is what we're looking for, that basically the path of the starlight is slightly bent as it passes near the sun, such that the apparent location of the star is in a slightly different place uh, than it would be if the star were not present. That's the signal that we're looking for. So this is a side view, and then this is a view of what we might actually see if we were trying to look through a telescope. So the actual position of the stars would be here, closer to the sun, but because the sun is a very massive object and it distorts the space-time around it, it would cause the star, the image of the star, to appear slightly further out than it would otherwise. Again, by this very, very small difference. So this is what Einstein predicted. And so people went out to look for this, and the first opportunity uh, actually came during World War I. Um, and in particular, what has been called the World War I eclipse uh, that occurred on 21 August 1914. And luckily for Einstein, the observers who went to go look for this didn't actually make it. What happened is that this was in 1914, uh, and it was a German and American who went to go look. The eclipse was happening in the Crimea. And as they were traveling, the war broke out between Germany and Russia. So the German astronomer got captured by the Russians. And they said, oh no, we don't believe this at all, that you're looking for an eclipse, you're obviously a spy. So they imprisoned him. The Americans are like, okay, well, you know, you're neutral. You can keep going. It turned out that it got clouded out, though. So the Americans didn't see it either. And it's good. It's good for Einstein that they that they didn't make their observations because it turned out that Einstein's initial version of the, of the theory had a mathematical mistake, and it would have actually been extremely embarrassing for Einstein um, had these guys made the observations and realized uh, realized the mistake. Uh, this was corrected by Einstein. It was, it was pointed out to him. He corrected it in time uh, for the next opportunity, which came in 1919, another total solar eclipse. Again, it had to be an eclipse, right, because it's this very small effect, and you had to see these stars that were located nearly behind the sun. And so Arthur Eddington uh, was one of, the, one of the scientists who made this observation. And this is, it turned out that the, that the observations that were made matched up with Einstein's prediction. Right, so here was an example of not only how he predicted you know, the orbit of Mercury, but now he was predicting something new, something new that had never been seen before. Um, so this is what actually made Einstein famous. Right, it wasn't until this period that he really became kind of a household name. And so you can see this newspaper article. This is from the New York Times. Lights all askew in the heavens. You know, men of science more or less agog over uh, results of eclipse observations. I wish the newspapers today were so lively about our discoveries. Um, you know, what can you do? Right? We try our best. 
Um, so anyhow, uh, you know, Einstein became a household name overnight, right? And, and, and this theory of general relativity moved from kind of this obscure idea to becoming you know, really sort of the foundation of our understanding of gravity. So if you take the theory of general relativity seriously, and I think that we should, right? If you take this idea seriously, this is, this is really the whole point of science. So like this, this is the point we're driving home, is that theories exist to make predictions make predictions that we can go out and that we can test. That's really the value of a, of a physical theory. And so if you take general relativity seriously, it makes all kinds of predictions, some of which are extremely strange. And one of the strangest is the existence of black holes. And so black holes are now you become a pop culture phenomenon. This is a screenshot from the movie Interstellar, uh, which is a sci-fi movie from a couple years ago. Maybe some people have seen it. Um, if you want to know what happens when you fall into a black hole, ask back in the kind of <laughs> But, uh, you know, this isn't science fiction. You know, we actually know that black holes exist, right? That there are regions of space-time that are so incredibly dense, where gravity is so strong, that it's warped space-time in a way that even light cannot escape. And this is what makes a black hole. And in fact, the strongest evidence uh, from this has come from the recent detection of what are called gravitational waves. These are actually ripples in space time that are created when two massive objects, like two massive black holes, merge with each other. It makes all of space time that like, literally shudder, and these ripples start propagating out in all directions. Um, and so the first time this was observed uh, was actually just in the fall of last year, in September 2015. Uh, there was a new detector called LIGO, and people have been looking for this signal for you know, decades, decades, searching for this, and they finally saw this signal. And what they saw uh, exactly matched the predictions that Einstein had made in general relativity. So not only was this incredible, you know, the most direct evidence yet that black holes exist, in this case, two black holes, each about 30 times the mass of the sun, merging with each other nearly the speed of light. Not only did they exist, but the ripple that it made in space-time, the way that it literally made space and time shape, exactly matched uh, with the theory that Einstein had predicted. To give a sense of how amazing this event was, the energy that was released by these two black holes colliding with each other was equivalent to all of, of, all of the emission from all of the stars and the galaxies in the entire observable universe times 10, right, for this brief moment in time, right? An incredible energetic and incredibly violent uh, event. Again, an, an astounding confirmation of this idea of general relativity. This is what this would actually look like. Uh, this is a, a computer simulation showing uh, what this event of these two supermassive black holes. You can see how this is showing the gravitational lensing, how they would appear to distort uh, the space time around them. Um, and so these objects would be circling each other you know, a few times per second, getting faster and faster and faster until they actually merge uh, right around here. You can see how the space time is just you know, moving and shaking around. Them. This is, this is the signal that we were looking for. We finally found it. So one of the other things that we can do with general relativity is that it, it's given us a framework not only to understand individual objects, like the sun, the moon, the planets, black holes. It's also given us a way to think about the whole universe and how the whole universe has grown and changed over time. So this is a view as if we could, you know, somehow we had a hyperspace machine if we were like, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars or something, we could fly. Each of these fuzzy objects is representing an individual galaxy, galaxies that we've mapped out their locations uh, with telescopes. And so our observable universe has something like 100, 100 billion galaxies at least. Right? So our, our Milky Way right, has about 100 billion stars. And there's like 100 billion galaxies out there in the observable universe. And the universe could just keep on going. We actually even don't even know where it ends. There's only the part that we've been able to see because light can travel so far. And so the geometry of, of how space is shaped and how the galaxies are oriented, it turns out that this is controlled by gravity. Gravity is the only force that we know of that can actually operate over these long distances, these distances of millions of light years between the galaxies. And so it's a very real sense Gravity is actually the force that shapes the overall evolution of the universe. And so to understand gravity is essential to understand our place in the universe overall. So one of the really key people in this work uh, is a woman named Vera Rubin. 
And her work was actually instrumental in terms of understanding how galaxies form and using gravity in a really innovative way. What she realized is that when she was looking at the stars and galaxies and how they were moving, um, is that their motion could only be explained if there was uh, an enormous amount of matter that was somehow invisible, that somehow didn't produce or emit light. And so nowadays we call this dark matter. And it was really Vera Rubin uh, who brought this paradigm into the scientific consciousness that made this, this mainstream through her work. And incidentally, she was actually awarded uh, the James Craig Watson Prize uh, for, her, for her work. So it's kind of a, an interesting example of story, you know, history coming back on, on itself. Um, hopefully, we're not dealing with the modern day Vulcan. And, I, and I, think, I think there's so many observations nowadays coming from many, many different telescopes, many different ways, that I, I think will actually bear out Vera Rubin's ideas as being, uh, as being uh, the, the reality. One of the ways uh, that we can actually study how matter is distributed in the universe at large is we can use the same technique of gravitational lensing. That remember that the position of the stars was deflected. The, the apparent image was different from the true location because of the position of the sun, this massive object that was distorting space-time. And so we can actually apply the same idea. And we can look at the shapes and the positions of galaxies, and we can actually map out matter in the universe. And so the interesting thing about this is because we're, we're doing by literally measuring space and time, we don't even have to, we're, we're sensitive to both the visible matter and stars, but we're also sensitive to this invisible matter, the dark matter, right? So in some sense, this is the most accurate map that we have of matter in the universe, and we've been able to do this over, to see you know, how this matter is distributed over the last two to eight billion years using this technique. This is one of the projects that I work on. We've uh, further taken this idea to look back at even more ancient light. This is the most ancient light, the oldest light that we can look back and see in the universe. It's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And it's the first time that atoms had formed and light was able to travel freely through the universe. This light was created uh, about 13.8 billion years ago, about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And so what this map is representing is if you were to take the sphere on the sky, if you were to look out in all directions, you can see this, this, uh, this radio emission, this cosmic microwave background. If you were to unfold the globe of the sky, just like we unfold the globe of the Earth, and make it into a map, this is what this looks like. And these variations uh, that you see in color are representing very, very minuscule uh, changes in the amount of matter in the universe at that particular time. And so these very small differences, uh, these are about one part in 100,000, which is about the same level as the vibrations in the air come from when we're just talking to each other, just at a, at a, at a, you know, at a normal speaking voice. These very, very small uh, changes in density, this is where all of the galaxies in the universe arose from, that, uh, that basically these very tiny perturbations grew into all of the structure that we see today. So this is our earliest, earliest map of the universe. And we can go back, you know, and so one of the things I want to mention is that, uh, and I'll talk about this a bit more later, uh, this is the statistical information in this map boiled down into a plot. And so it's not, it's not necessary to actually understand exactly what's in this plot. The point that I want to make is that the red points are our measurements, and this green curve is the theory. So you can, if you look at this and you're a physicist and you know, know, know anything about you know, science, technology, when you look at this, this should give your heart better patterns, right? <laughs> There's this extremely amazing agreement between the theoretical predictions, and again, these are made with our current understanding of gravity compared to the observations. And so when we say, you know, we're seeing these new phenomena and we don't know how to explain the dark matter, the dark energy, the inflation, this is why we're so convinced. This is why we think that there are these incredibly profound and interesting questions still left to explore because we have this extremely precise data and it's leading us to ask new questions that we weren't able to ask even a couple decades ago. So the furthest back, the furthest evidence that we can see um, you know, for what's, what is happening in our universe actually comes from a period that was only 10 seconds to about 20 minutes after the Big Bang. So this is, this is going back as far as we can. And what this is, is that it's the elemental composition of the universe. That basically, if you think about the periodic table of elements uh, that we learned about in chemistry class, 
um, that, that this model, this, you know, this model of how the universe works, makes a very specific prediction for how many of these different elements we should observe in the universe. And so this prediction is that uh, out of all the atoms in the universe, about 92% of them are the simplest atom, hydrogen, which is composed of just a single proton and an orbiting electron. There's 8% of helium, okay? And then the heavy elements are less than a percent. Okay? And we've been able to go out and measure this, and it, it exactly matches with the prediction. And so this is all atoms that were formed in a period when the universe was so hot that these nuclear reactions were happening all the time and actually caused the elements to be formed. Incidentally, helium, helium is named after Helios, the sun, because it was actually discovered during an eclipse in 1868. It was first identified by looking at the corona of the sun. It was only actually identified on the Earth uh, you know, several decades later. So another interesting example of where the eclipse has played into uh, our scientific understanding. So what I've said here, and, you know, and the reason why I talk about all these different observations of the universe at large, is because when we use our modern understanding of gravity, this theory of general relativity, we can explain all of the current cosmological observations with a simple, you know, it's a remarkably simple, but it's a perplexing theory. And I'll explain why. It's because it requires three special ingredients that go beyond all of our current understanding. And I would say that we wouldn't believe this, right? Like if you ask people, they'd say, ah, oh, this can't be, you know, we should be skeptical. Except for that we have all of these incredibly precise observations. And so one of these is what I call the dark matter which you know, Vera Rubin had done her work looking at galaxies. And so we think that actually this invisible matter, there's actually about five times as much of it as all of the atoms in the universe. That all, everything that we see in the stars, the galaxies, the planets, that all of this is only about, you know, is only about one sixth of all the matter in the universe. So what is that? Like, what, what can we learn if we actually were to discover what this dark matter is? In addition, most of the, of the matter and energy in the universe today is in this totally unknown uh, quantity that we call dark energy. And the simplest way to explain dark energy is to think of it like an energy of space itself. When Einstein wrote down his theory of general relativity, he included the possibility that this would exist, but even he himself was very skeptical of it. And it actually took you know, decades of observations um, for us to realize that this appears to be a critical component of the universe. We actually cannot explain our observations unless we include this concept of dark energy. And then finally, there's this idea of inflation, which takes us back to the very first instance of creation. This idea that the universe grew in size by some incredible factor in the first trillion of a trillion of a trillion of a second after the Big Bang. And this sounds, you know, again, crazy and preposterous, except for we cannot explain our observations with the cosmic microwave background unless something like this occurs, right? All three of these are totally new questions about the universe that we've never been able to ask before. And so I want to bring, like, make the point that these are not, you know, these are not sort of details. These aren't things that we can sweep under the rug. When we talk about inflation, we're really asking how did the universe begin? When we talk about dark matter, we're asking, what is the universe made out of? And when we ask about dark energy, we're saying, how will the universe end? I mean, these are really deep questions that humans have always asked, and now we actually have the technology to go out and try to answer these questions. Um, so one of the projects that I work on is called the Dark Energy Survey, where our goal is to better understand this dark energy and how it's changing the overall evolution of the universe. And this is a really good point to, you know, a good time to make the point that when we talk about science now in the year 2017, this has actually been true for several decades, it's not work that's done by individual scientists. This is work that's done by teams of hundreds of physicists, astronomers, engineers, construction workers, administrators, all working together from around the world. And so I think it's actually, you know, really inspiring you know, that you know, we live in this time where there's so much conflict in the world, and yet we can come together to try to answer these really fundamental and universal questions about where humanity belongs in the universe and how we, how we fit in. This is just a map showing where our collaborator, collaborators have come from, where they were born and where they're working today. And you can see that it covers the entire globe. And so, uh, one of the, the projects that I'm also working on is called the Large Synoptic Survey Tel Telescope. Uh, this is now under construction in Chile. This is the main telescope. 
Uh, this was an idea that first started in 1998. It will be the most powerful telescope ever built. We will catalog more stars and galaxies than all previous astronomical surveys put together. We'll survey the entire sky visible from Chile every three nights, and we'll see something like 40 billion stars and galaxies. And we'll map out how they're changing over the entire history of the universe. And so uh, this idea, again, started in 1998. Well, now this is a real photograph where we're building the project. This is just a helper telescope. You know, so we're putting the dome on this picture. People are very excited and this is becoming a reality. But we're really trying to understand these questions I've talked about. The dark matter, the dark energy, inflation. This is, you know, this is the way that we're moving forward. And again, it's hundreds of scientists all working together from around the world to try to accomplish these goals. And you know, for me, I'm just one small part of that whole effort. So I also want to use this opportunity to mention, particularly to the young people in the audience, uh, that I think this is a really a tremendously exciting time to enter the field. Um, that uh, if you like learning something new every day, tackling big unsolved mysteries about nature, you know, building one of a kind unique machines, seeing something that no one has ever seen before, collaborating with people from around the world, and even practical things like getting paid to go to grad school, right? You should think about physics and astronomy. Right? Like this is, a, this is a career path that I think a lot of people are maybe intimidated about. They take their courses in high school, they think this is really hard. And what I really want to emphasize is that you don't have to be a genius to do this work. You know, this requires many, many different skills. And the same, you know, what, what you do in the classroom to solve a textbook problem, you know, what, what we're actually doing is we're trying to solve problems that have no bounded answer. Right? We're trying to answer questions that are so big that we don't even know where to begin. And so that's what physicists do. And that's why I think it's, you know, it's the type of thing where many people may have these skills, they may have these talents, they may have these creativities, and somehow they're discouraged and they just, you know, they don't see that it's a path for them. So I really want to encourage people to see themselves in this field and think about how they might be able to contribute. And so the way to do this, right, take your math classes, take your computer science classes, take physics, astronomy, and uh, just see how far it gets you. And I think, that regardless of what you do, if you take this path, you'll have a huge number of career opportunities ahead of you in all areas of science and technology. So I just want to end by saying, enjoy the eclipse. Uh, it's such a rare event. Uh, it's 2 minutes and 38 seconds. So for me, I'm not going to be taking photographs. I'm just going to be looking up and enjoying it. Uh, and I hope you will take some time to enjoy it, but also think about how the eclipse has uh, helped us in our understanding of science overall. Thanks. Why is the telescope being built in Chile, and where exactly? 
Uh, so it is, is located in Chile because Chile has several things going for it. Uh, it's up in the mountains, so you're, A, you're trying to get above as much of the atmosphere as possible, because when we look through the atmosphere, uh, the light from the stars and galaxies gets slightly distorted, and so the higher we can get up, uh, the less of that distortion, so we get sharper images of the, of the night sky. Uh, additionally, Chile has the advantage uh, that it's extremely dry. It's one of the driest deserts in the world in that, in that region, and so uh, if there's clouds, uh, we can't see through those clouds with an optical telescope. And so we want to have uh, a region of sky, a region of, of the planet where we're able to do our observations as many nights of the year as possible. Um, finally, uh, the Chileans have been extremely welcoming and encouraging in terms of having international collaborations. And so I work with, uh, with many Chilean scientists, and they are you know, really brilliant and outstanding people to work with. And uh, they've really uh, helped, helped make this collaboration happen. Yeah, in the back. Could you elaborate a bit more on the discovery of helium, what was it, uh, 1868 in an eclipse? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so this, this was actually, uh, it's, 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 important, it's important to bring up, so the, the idea here is that when, when you look at an astronomical object, you have an opportunity uh, to take the light from that object and break it up into the electromagnetic spectrum, that you can see the different wavelengths or equivalently the, the different frequencies of light. And it turns out that every chemical element has a very distinct kind of fingerprint in that, in that space of wavelength and frequency. And so we can use this to identify the chemical composition of an object, even though it's very far away, that we would never be able to send a probe there directly. And so uh, people have used this throughout the history of astronomy and it's actually really profound when you think about it that you can look at an astronomical object and see that it's made out of the same type of stuff that we have here on the Earth, right? You know, like the, the, the moon is not made of cheese, right? It's kind of, it's kind of the, the, the lame example, right? But, but it's, it's actually kind of amazing to think that the, you know, the, these, these incredibly extreme, unusual objects that seem totally different from life here on Earth are actually made of the same type of stuff. And so, uh, with the example of, of helium, it was, it was detected as these spectral lines uh, in the yellow part of the spectrum that had just never been seen before. And so, you know, people weren't quite sure what to make of it, uh, but, you know, chemists were very smart, and they had realized that there were places on the periodic table where there was, you know, a space for a new element, and they, I think this is really genius of them, that they actually left those spaces. That they, that they realized sort of their incomplete knowledge. And so when they, when they saw helium here, they kind of fit it into that gap. And it wasn't until you know, decades later that they actually isolated it on the Earth. Because it's very, it's very rare in the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah? Uh, a question about the moon. Yeah? I've been looking for it all day today. I think it might be close to where we're at. I haven't seen it all this time. Yeah, 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 that's right. So the, so the moon should be very, very close to the sun and the sky. Um, my Guess is that it's so okay. So if you think about the geometry, it's actually the, the far side of the moon from the Earth that's being illuminated right now, and so the the part that's facing us will be largely dark. And if it's close to the sun, then it, it may just not be bright enough to see during the daytime. Um, that basically it's, it's outshined by the by the light of the sun. No, I, I see a lot of things during the daytime, but I, I didn't see it today. Yeah, yeah. So so that's 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 why it's. it's, it's Getting into position. Keith, maybe, uh, maybe one more, and then I know he'll stay afterward, but I'm going to dismiss us after that. So if you'll take one more question. Then sure, we'll sure. Um, I'll take this one from Hi. First of all, thank you so much for this presentation. And um, secondly, I was really excited to learn that he name was discovered through the 1868 eclipse. Mm -hmm. And I would like something exciting, a theory, or something that is expected to be discovered or um, has been theorized and will be conclusive with this eclipse? Ah, great question. Um, so to be, to be completely honest, I am not a heliophysicist, which means you know, someone, someone who, who studies the sun. So I don't know that I'm actually the best qualified person to talk about specifically the scientific investigations that are happening around this eclipse. I think one of the exciting opportunities was one we just heard about, uh, whereby 
you know, because this eclipse is so unusual that it crosses, uh, you know, the whole continent of the United States, we have this long period to observe it, then we can see phenomena of a longer duration than we could otherwise by stitching together the images. Um, so I think that's one exciting opportunity. Uh, but I would say that at least, at least at this moment in time, I think it's fair to say that the, the you know, while eclipses have been extremely important in the overall history of science, uh, that right now, you know, the eclipse is actually very well understood, rel relatively speaking, and that you know many of our investigations have turned to these questions about the overall evolution of the universe. I will say that you know this idea of when an object passes in front of another and creates a shadow. But this same idea is actually now one of our leading ways to discover planets around other stars, so-called exoplanets. And actually thousands of planets around other stars have been detected using the same method. So if you, you, know, if you, if you think of more, more generally about this idea of you know, you know, planets and stars coming into alignment, you know, this is really an inspiration for some of the most cutting edge research that's happening today. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, but, but at least around like the 2017 eclipse, um, I, I guess I don't know specifically exactly uh, what, what types of investigations are planned. Let's uh, thank Keith one more time. I would say that's huge. What a great presentation. <laughs> and a uh, couple news notes. Uh, if you're coming south uh, through, say, Dillard or North Carolina tomorrow, we're going to park you on the campus initially to the event. If you're coming from Clayton North, we're going to park you in the Ramey parking lot behind the Chick-fil-A on Ramey Boulevard. There'll be signs, so no problem, and we'll bless you up from there. If that parking fills, we're going to use the business park. So those are our three main parking areas tomorrow. We're expecting over 2,500 cars tomorrow and 10,000 people. So everybody be patient and polite. The two words that we want to use. Allow extra time to get here. We're going to actually start busing from the Ramey lot about 9.30. So come early if you'd like, park, and then we'll start the bus service. No parking on the campus tonight, please. Nobody's uh, allowed to camp overnight. So everybody's got to leave and come back tomorrow. And once again, Laura Gurley is going to be in the back in the lobby. If you have uh, interest in being one of our volunteers tomorrow, please let her know. We can sure use your help. With that, adjourned and so much. Thank you very much.